If we tell the dead to rise, then they will rise. Stop wasting the power. Until your reason is accomplished, the power has not been given to any devil to kill you. He whom the Son has set free is. Whatever God gives you is sufficient, come on, for your assignment in life. You see, this morning I want us to continue where we stopped on Thursday or give more emphasis to our meditation lines on Thursday. Let us pray. Father, take all the glory. Let your spirit and your word go forth with power. Let there be deliverance on Mount Zion. Let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my reference scripture is Philippians chapter 1 in verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 in verse 6. This was a letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Philippi. I read. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me take it again. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was writing to appreciate and encourage the church, the young believers in Philippi who were not ashamed of his chains who were still identifying not only just praying supporting with their substance given and he was praying for them in his letter and he made this statement he said I'm confident of this the God who has started this good work in you who got you to be this considerate thoughtful he will perfect his work in you until the time of the Lord in Jesus name now what we want to consider here twofold um, we began to look at it on Thursday and first we are looking at the character of God I'll bring it out for you in a minute and we're looking at the conviction of Paul and what about the character of God these are God's qualities the nature of God I mean this is what he's made of this is who he is like somebody who put it into this language this is what God does anyhow you turn him around this is God and what about this quality we are talking about today whatever he starts he completes so paul said i am confident that what god has started in you he will complete can i pause in a moment and tell someone in the name of jesus every good work god has started in you he will finish it in the name of jesus hallelujah so god finishes what he starts so let's establish that first of all in the book of Genesis, in chapter 1, we're told of how God created the heavens and the earth. By the time we go to chapter 2, in verse 2, the Bible says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. One version says, and God finished his work, which he has started. I'm establishing here that it is his quality, it is his nature, that's his character. When he starts a thing, he finishes it. In the book of John, in chapter 4, verse 34, here we found Jesus passing through Samaria with his disciples. And they had walked the whole day, traveled the whole day, exhausted and tired. And disciples are now going into the city to look for something to eat. Get them food. Get the whole team some food. Left Jesus behind, sitting by the well of Samaria. But by the time that we come back, a woman of Samaria had come to fetch water. You know the story. And Jesus had engaged her in a dialogue. So by the time they came and found Jesus talking to a lady, a gentile, they were surprised. One, he shouldn't be doing that. Or the Gentiles will not talk to the Jews as it were. There was this taboo there. And more so in those days, men and women don't just talk in public. So, they were wondering. 
how come he's full of energy and talking and they were wondering could he have gotten something to eat as it were then he replied them in verse 34 i read jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me watch this and to finish his work you see as far as heaven is concerned whatever he started will be finished hello god finishes what he starts in john chapter 19 in verse 30 jesus had been born jesus had done all his work on earth his mission on earth was now being concluded the consummation of his assignment on earth was the cross of jesus christ and he suffered so many things injustice ridicule torture i mean finally death on the cross painful death look at how it all ended john 19 30 and i read so when jesus had received the sour wine remember he was on the cross he said it is finished hear me if it is god there must be a finishing point whatever he starts he finishes glory be to god in the highest isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10 god will describe himself to the children of israel through the prophet isaiah hear what he said remember the former things of old for i am god and there is no other I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My cancer shall stand and I will do my pleasure. So, in other words, what makes me God? When I start, I declare the, the end. I declare the end from the beginning. By the time I'm starting, I'm telling you the end time. I'm telling you the end point. I'm telling you that this is finished already. In other words, if you see me in a project, it's because it's finished. If you can locate God in any project on earth, it is because it's completed. He's the author and the finisher. So what are we saying? Whatever God starts, he finishes. Remember the story of the prodigal son in the Bible? Jesus was trying to explain in the best visible way the heart of God to his disciples. They said the father had two sons, remember? And the younger one was so rascally. And then God, all that he thought he needed, put pressure on the father. The father gave it to him. His portion of the inheritance and they went to waste it. Now, one would have thought, well, Good riddance. He was rascally, he was stubborn, he was disobedient, he was insubordinate, he was whatever. But God's heart was such that, no. I know the thoughts I have towards you, not of evil but of good, to give you a hope and a future. So even in that state, the father was yearning for the return of the boy. A good way to compare this thing is to contrast rather is this. The elder brother thought he's gone with his mess, so let him remain messed up. But the father's heart was such that no 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 no. I would rather that he repents and he returns home and he finishes his course. Let me say to you again one more time. God does not wish you dead. God does not wish you fail. Wherever you are going through right now, you will finish your assignment in Jesus' name. Whatever God starts, he finishes. Another example. David in the Bible. How old do you think he was when Samuel anointed him as king? The Bible is not very clear on that. They were given that must have been somewhere between the ages of 8 and 15. But when did he become king? It's on record that he was 30 years old. So in other words, for what looked like 15 years, he was waiting to assume what for goodness sake God himself sent his prophet to ordain him and anoint him for. See, for a lot of us, we take delay 
to be failure. Delay is never failure. And even the gap, in the gap, you know what happened? It wasn't just that he was saying when, when, no. He went through the most troublesome times of his life. That was when he was he was brought to the to King Saul's palace and he would play to calm down so when he would be raving mad with some tormenting spirit. And Saul, the captain of the army, the commander in chief rather of the army, a man mighty at war, would pick his javelin and aim at David a short range to kill him. But God will save him, he would duck. And he came that way until he started, until they escaped. Saul let out the entire army of Israel to go after David. See, it was bad enough that what God promised and what God has done was not materializing. In addition, the whole army was after him. It was so bad at the time he had to feign madness and pretend to be a madman just to have to stay alive. At the time, he almost betrayed his covenant brethren, his covenant people, by faking to be loyal to the Philistines king to fight. So he put himself in very, very dangerous situations. On some occasions, Saul and his army would trap him. He would miraculously escape. So they were very, very difficult periods for him. But the question is this, did he become king? Oh yes, he did. He did. And so I'm saying to someone here today, regardless of what you may be going through, please hear me. If you don't remember anything of this message, know that it is never in God's nature to abandon his project. It's never in God's nature to abandon what he starts. Whatever God starts, he will finish. You will finish well in Jesus' name. Remember the story of Joseph? he was a young boy again i tried to do a little research in there to find out when that happened the bible said around age 17. all right he was sleeping and god came to him and said i'm going to make you a leader of an unusual type you are going to be an uncommon leader in your life so much so that even your dad and your mom will bow to your leadership but you see that attracted the envy of his brethren, of his brothers. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 9, we have said, and the Patrick, being envious of Joseph, sold him into slavery. It was in 17, remember? Then what happened? The day they had the opportunity, the first thoughts that came to their mind, let's kill him. But you see, when God is involved, it's not only that he will finish, you won't die, you will finish in the name of Jesus. But they ended selling selling him into slavery and then told their father a lie that he was dead and they had a burial service for him well in egypt he found favor like it was somebody departed but he ran into trouble with his first wife the favor of god on his life was the same thing that brought him trouble with this woman who wanted to sleep with him and so he was again he was misjudged he was wrongly sentenced and I believe he was sentenced to death row. You say, what do you mean death row? Because the two companions that were mentioned of his in the prison were on death row. The baker and the butler. The butler invariably was free. The baker was killed. But what, this is what I'm saying. From age 17, what this guy and what, what this guy encountered was trouble, 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 trouble. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 9, the Bible says, and the patriarch becoming envious, sold him into slavery. But God was with him, verse 10 says, and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh. Hallelujah. You see? But now, good 13 years of torture. For many, it will look like God had abandoned him. But what God starts, he finishes. He became king. Uh, normally we just think about it and said, wait a minute. The Bible said that Pharaoh made him king. So much so that nobody on earth could eat without the approval of Joseph. So I wondered what the scenario would have been like when Potiphar and his wife would visit to take what to eat, bowing to Joseph. 
possibly Potiphar will feel, oh no, things can turn around for good. But what do you think Potiphar's wife will be thinking? Can I say this to you? No matter what you have gone through, no matter what you are going through, whatever God starts, He finishes. You will finish well in Jesus' name. I can go on and on to give you more examples in the Bible that whatever God starts, He finishes. Oh, He said to Abraham, Hey, your descendants will be like the sands of the sea in number to a man that had no child. When Abraham will put pressure and pressure and pressure on him, he said, as a matter of fact, let me be friend with you. Your descendants will be so many free. First of all, they'll be slaves in a foreign land. Then when the cup of iniquity of the Amorites are full, I will release them. Everything he said he did. It wasn't only that Isaac was born at his, I mean, at, at a very old age. Abraham's descendants spread across the globe. We are part of them today. By faith, we are his descendants. We are the seed of Abraham. <laughs> Whatever he says, he will do. Whatever he says, he will do. And when he was telling the children of Israel, I'm, I'm taking you out of this bondage. 400 years. And I'm taking you to a land flowing with milk and honey. It looks totally impossible. But he did it. When he got them out and he started seeing some troubles, they thought, no, 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 it can, it, this could not work. But those who believed, God there, whatever God says, he does. Whatever he starts, he finishes. There's no stagnation that can keep you from accomplishing God's purpose in your life. God never walks away. Man may walk away, not God. I don't know who I'm talking to. After this service, get up. Strengthen the weakness and see the salvation of God in Jesus' name. I think I've done enough about that. It is established that if it is God, He will finish what He started. It's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last is the author and the finisher he finishes what he starts he finishes what he starts did you hear me he finishes what he starts hear him talking to the children of israel through prophet isaiah isaiah 66 9 he says shall i bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery says the lord Shall I who cause delivery? Shut up the womb, says the Lord. You think I will prepare you so much and fail you? I will never do that. I will bring you to an expected end, said the Almighty God. Your future is better than whatever delay you have suffered. Whatever God has set out to do with you, He will do in the name of Jesus. Still in Isaiah, Say, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You will not be tired. You will not give up. If God does not give up on you, you will not give up on yourself. In the name of Jesus. I am certain somebody is hearing this today and you will write me and we will rejoice together. In the name of Jesus. Don't make any irrational decision. God is so interested in your case. As a matter of fact, you are a special project in the hand of God. He loves you. Now, that's his nature. Now that we have established the character of God, he's a God that starts and finishes. Let's get back into our opening verse. Philippians 1 verse 6. And I read again. Being confident of this one thing, of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. Let me give you that version in the Amplified Bible. I am convinced and confident that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ's return. 
am convinced and confident. Now look at the expanded version of the Bible. It says, I am sure. I am confident. I am persuaded. In the message version, this is how it reads. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you will keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. He will keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. He will keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. He will keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. Now, it's further buttressing what we have said. So, why will Paul be this confident of this? That's God's character. And we know God's characters are really amazing. He is love. He is merciful. But the problem is, we don't seem to understand him enough to allow him be himself with us. I'm talking of God. But here was a man who knew the character of God and could stake anything on that character. For Paul to say, being very confident, that was quite emphatic. That was phenomenal. So I asked myself the question, what was behind Paul's confidence? And I realized that Paul, on his own, had a personal experience with God. And until a man or a woman has an experience with God, he or she may never be able to exude this kind of confidence. But the unfortunate thing is that we need this to appropriate all that Christ has done for us. Every man needs to be this confident. Now, here Paul, in his own testimony before Agrippa, for you to fully understand what I'm saying, Acts 6 verse 12, Paul was now talking before Agrippa. He said, while those occupied, verse 12, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, so, so, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the gods. Now, listen to this quickly. He said, I saw the light. I heard the voice. And these are the things he said to me. Paul had a personal experience with God. He said, in that, in that encounter, we all fell to the ground and he spoke to me. Now, let's go further. So I said to him, verse 15, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. May rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. Did you hear that? I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of things which I will yet reveal to you. Now, hear me. Paul, in this encounter, experienced the person of Jesus. He had a revelation of Jesus. For Paul, this was real. Now, for anybody, when it comes to God, you may doubt. Okay, I'll give you an example. Paul was in a shipwreck. And every expert there thought that was the end of their lives. But he said, I saw the angel of the Lord, whom I believe and whom I belong, standing by me, saying to me, don't worry yourself. You're not going to die. You are going to be standing before Caesar. Wow. To get to Caesar means that I will pass through the storm and I will get there. And he said something else. He said, and no one around you will die because I've given you their lives. Now, the reality then was that there was a shipwreck and they were about to die. But the super reality was that, Paul, you are not dying and nobody's dying. You are getting to Rome. And Paul will now answer Agrippa in verse 19 when he was giving his testimony. He said, Oh, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So, in other words, at any point in Paul's life, 
there was a natural and there was a heavenly vision that became more real to him and that was why he could explain he could say I am confident of this very thing but that's where God wants all of us to be today that's why he says the just shall live by faith I saw Paul quoting that in the book of Romans in chapter 1 See, as it is written, 117, the joy shall live by faith. But look at verses before. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. So regardless of what may come or could be facing him, his reality was defined by the, his conviction in the word and the person of Jesus, rather than the natural. Paul had a great conviction. Paul's example was really that of the just living by faith. And this showed in all his letters. And that's why in any of Paul's letters, you find words like, I am confident. I am persuaded. We know. Example is in 2 Timothy 1.12. Now he was writing to Timothy. Hear what he said. For this reason, I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to me until that day. Now, that was Paul. Every of his letter and almost every of his speech manifested the confidence that he had in the person and cause of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.25 is another place. Watch this. I'm being confident of this. I'm just trying to establish that these were his words. You always recognize Paul's writings. Being confident of this, I know that I shall remain. Now, what was happening here? He was telling them that, look, I think I'm coming to the end of my, you know, time to go. But he said, for me to remain is better for you. Then the next verse, and I said to them, but I am confident of this, that I will remain. I mean, he had a way with knowing the mind of God. I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. Another example is Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. Just to establish that, look, Paul was not a fake. This was the way he was. This was the way he spoke. And every time he spoke, it was born out of this conviction of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, as a Christian, we are not expected to do less. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. He said, in whom we have boldness, as in Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. Hallelujah. Glory be to God in the highest. Hallelujah. And if you look at Romans chapter 18 from verse 38, again, he was writing to the Roman church, and hear what he said in verse 38. For I am persuaded. Can you see that? Paul was always conveying his conviction. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here Paul said, I am persuaded. I am convinced. I know that there is nothing created that can separate us from the love of Christ. Can you imagine that? Oof. So talking about talking of Paul's conviction, it was born on an experience of Jesus. Someone said, he said, this Paul was a man of resolute convictions. I cannot agree more. You see, as a Judaizer, <laughs> his pedigree was unequal. He himself said this several in the epistles. Totally unequal. And as a Christian, it has been said that Paul was the greatest credential Christianity has ever produced. You can't find another, or at least up until now. And Paul will write always for one purpose, to inspire this, this kind of conviction in us. And that's why before I conclude today, I want to encourage you. Here Paul, talking to the Hebrew Christian, 
in chapter 12 verse 2 which we quoted last sunday we have been shown the catalog in chapter 11 of great heroes who finished well and paul will now have us understand that as great as they were as heroic as their exploits were say there's something more with you the whole of creation is waiting for you all those who have gone are waiting for your own exploits to conclude their own in other words as great as this ones are you have much more to come with you so i'm saying to you right now in the name of jesus will you in the light of this still be dreaming of being stuck it's time to get up there's more to do god doesn't see you like you have been seeing yourself you're a new creation a creature rather than christ jesus as much about the whole of creation is waiting for you So it now says in chapter 12, verse 2, of verse 1 says, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those who have made it, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, this is where I'm going. It says, Looking unto Jesus. So, how do I get inspired? Paul is saying, The way you get to be like this is keep looking at Jesus and what does that do the problem with us and where we get stuck usually is because we never take our eyes off the problems you can't find the solution by continuously looking at the problems by continuously meditating on the failures you cannot find solution what that does is that it preoccupies you and keeps on playing the picture of your failure before you and what Paul is saying is, he says, hey, 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 this Jesus is the author and the finisher. Who determines the end is Jesus. Will you please leave that for a moment and give Jesus some attention? You see, what you look at continuously, you become. If you keep looking at the problem, you become more like the problem. You now switch and look more at Jesus, you become like Jesus. You are a winner. You are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You are head, you are not tail. You are above one and never beneath. You are the light of your world look on to Jesus the author and the finisher of your faith he wrote to inspire and now we have been inspired in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 the Bible says but we all with unveiled face beholding us in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the lord in other words when you look you become like what you look so the more we look at him you can't look at jesus and not see his glory so rather than the woes and the failures and it what i see is the glory of the lord rather than the sadness and the mourning and the moodiness what i see is the joy of the lord what i see is the celebration of the victory of the lord and that becomes very inspiring and highly motivating. You will finish well. Looking unto Jesus, the more you look, the more you become like him. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You will pass through, you will walk through, you will break through, you will overcome whatever you are going through today. In the name of Jesus, you are finishing well. In Jesus' name. Still talking about Paul inspiring us. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Now it was right to the Ephesian church. Here Paul was admonishing the church to put on the whole armor of God. And he had listed them. They would be guarded with the waste of truth and have to put on the breastplate of righteousness, uh -huh, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. In conclusion, it came to verse 18 and said, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit that's what i want to take from there how do you get inspired how do you overcome challenges how do you overcome roadblocks the bible says jesus teaching in luke 18 that men ought always to pray and not faint men ought always to pray and not become stagnated you want to avoid being stagnant or stagnated pray 
focus on Jesus. Pray. And what makes it interesting is I pray in the spirit. So I put at the margin of my heart that don't you ever live life without the consciousness of the Holy Spirit. He's the great helper. Even when I don't know how to pray, he helps me to pray. I can see you overcoming. I can see you winning in the name of Jesus. Indeed, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Thank God for your life. Weeping might have endured the whole night, but I see joy beaming over right now in the name of Jesus. You are indeed head, you are not tail. You are above only, never beneath. I see you winning in life in Jesus' name. I see you overcoming. Is it a troubled son? A troubled teenager? We arrest them back home in Jesus' name. We destroy the controlling spirit over their lives in the name of Jesus. Is it a troubled marriage? We speak the peace of God over their home in the name of Jesus. Is it, is it your health? We decree healing in the name of Jesus. By his stripes we are healed. Your career. I decree wisdom and direction in Jesus name. I decree the favor of God over your life in the name of Jesus. You see, you are special in God's hands. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. As a matter of fact, he is saying to you today, come home. Don't let the accuser continue to tell you lies. God loves you with an everlasting love. The problem is, you're realizing it and accepting it, which I believe today you are beginning to do. Will you come home now? The father of the program son has his arms wide open, waiting for the day the boy will surface. He was coming back thinking, oh no, I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be reduced. I'm going to be relegated. No, he was celebrated. You'll be celebrated back home in Jesus' name. Your days of glory is like way, way, way ahead of you. It is well with you in Jesus' name. Being confident of this very thing, that He who has started this good work in you will finish it even unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are deciding, yes, I'm rededicating my life today, or I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, Shall we pray? Say this after me. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son. And Jesus, I thank you for laying down your life for my soul. Today, I have come to realize that I'm a sinner. Cleanse me from my sins and fill me with your spirit. Henceforth, use me for your glory. I know that I will finish well in the name of Jesus. Father, I give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, I commit the lives of this man and this woman to you. Knowing fully well and being persuaded that whatever we commit to you, you are able to keep against that day. Father, give them quick understanding. Fill them with your power and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name. I speak life to you all in the name of Jesus. I speak peace to your lives, to your homes in Jesus' name. I release the joy of the Lord in all you do and your endeavors in Jesus' name. Shall we share the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And so sin shall not have dominion over us because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of us and the quickens our mortal bodies to the glory of his holy name. Amen. Until next Thursday during showers or Sunday during service. Remember we are confident of this very thing. That he who have started this good work in you will finish it 
if not today, come your Father Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.